David Levine, I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. I want to thank Joe Bonner, who's making this possible. He's behind the scenes. He's my, my co-chair as well of Swanee. Um, my guest tonight is Emily Anthes, who is a science journalist and author. Her new book is The Great Indoors, The Surprise Science About Buildings Shape Our Behavior, Health, and Happiness. Emily is a science journalist and author. Her other book is The Frankenstein's Cat, Cuddling Up to Biotech's Brave New Beasts, which was long listed for the Penn E. O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. She has written for the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Wired, Nature, Slate, Business Week. And she's won several awards, including the AAAS Calvi Science Journalism Award and the National Association of Science Writers Science and Society Journalism Award. She has a master's degree in science writing from MIT and a bachelor's degree in history of science and medicine from Yale, where she also studied creative writing. Um, so for everyone who's listening in, if you have questions, there's a question and answer box at the bottom. Um, and please put the Q and A's in there, your questions in there because um, not in the chat box, that's just for um, Joe and I and Emily to communicate if there's any problems. So Emily, I, I wanna ask you, why'd you write this book? Um, well, I joke uh, in the introduction that I've always been kind of indoorsy, um, which you know is also happens to be a joke that's true. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, inside, we all do, but I've always been someone that's sort of most comfortable um, you know, on my couch in my living room rather than exploring the, the big open outdoors. Um, and I think the sort of immediate spark for the book was seeing all the research that was happening on what's sometimes called the indoor microbiome. Um, so I started seeing all these studies come out sort of charting the microbes that live in our homes. Um, and they were fascinating in their own right, but they also sort of sparked this um, perspective shift for me where I began to think of my home and our buildings in general as ecosystems. And, you know, we normally think of ecosystems and landscapes as things that are happening outside, uh, but there's a real richness to what's happening in our buildings too. Um, and so that was sort of the, the initial spark. So what's going on with your shower head? <laughs> yeah, so some of the researchers who are doing this work um, at the time I was starting to interview them were in the midst of doing this sort of shower head microbial survey. They were taking swabs um, from shower heads, hundreds of shower heads in the US and Europe and sequencing the DNA and then essentially itemizing all of the microbes that they found there. Um, so I got to participate. I sent in my own swab and um, found really a wide array of things. Um, some not so surprising, you know, there were bacteria that are commonly found in soil and tap water. And, you know, that's maybe what you would expect, uh, but also some more mysterious uh, tenants, um, including several species that aren't really un well understood um, or studied by scientists. Um, my favorite of these uh, is something that's uh, still known as RB41. Um, it doesn't have a, you know, a nice evocative name yet, um, but scientists don't know much about it, but two other places it's previously been found are dog noses and Paleolithic cave paintings and, and my shower head. Um, and so I just love the idea that, you know, this mysterious microbe connects all three of those very different environments. Okay, so should people take baths? Is that safe? <laughs> really? I don't know about that, but I mean, so that is, you know, that gets at an important point, which is that um, all this microbial life and this diversity is not bad. Um, a lot of these species are totally benign. Um, some of them are actually beneficial and seem to be good for our immune systems. And then, of course, there are some pathogens, um, mold and um, Legionella, which causes Legionnaire's disease. So there are a handful of those, but on balance, these are not things to be too worried about. Okay, so, uh, you know, so I first started reading this book and saying, you know, everyone is telling people to stay indoors mm -hmm. during the pandemic, although it's safer to be outside if you're dining or outside if you're walking. 
And, but we are, you know, but we were first told to stay indoors, um, watch TV, um, don't go outside. And, um, and um, so I, a, lot of you, a lot of the book you talk about, you know, redesigning um, homes to make people happier and healthier. Mm -hmm. So can you, give, can you give us a few examples of that? Absolutely. So I have two sort of go to my first tips um, always um, are nature and daylight. Um, and those are things that just have a really strong evidence base behind them. There's study after study after study in the literature showing that bringing nature and daylight into into any building, but you know, your home in this case um, has all sorts of beneficial effects from boosting mood, uh, reducing anxiety and stress, uh, improving sleep at night, um, you know, the whole gamut of things. Um, and you can also do that in a couple of different ways. So it's great if you're a plant person and you can, you know, stock your home with dozens of houseplants. Um, that has a lot of benefits, but it doesn't have to be like real live nature. Um, there are studies that show that artificial plants or even that photographs of nature on the wall or nature sounds, you know, playing out of speakers can have some of those same benefits. Um, so those are, you know, and then in terms of daylight, that's just a matter of, you know, you presumably can't reorient your home at this stage, but um, you can open your blinds and, you know, keep your curtains open. Um, those are two really simple things that pay big dividends. Okay, so, I mean, you talk about a lot of different things. Um, so, so I want to talk about, you know, how, you know, hospital design and how it can affect patient outcomes. So mm -hmm. I know my daughter gave birth in Columbia Presbyterian, and I, when I walked in the room, she said, "Dad, look at this view." Uh -huh. I was saying, "I really came to see the baby," but uh, <laughs> she had a view of the Hudson Hudson River. It was really wonderful, and she said it just made her happy every time she looked out the window. Mm -hmm. And but then again, but also, but you also say having a private room is also better for patient outcomes, and um, people want to have their own room. Mm -hmm. you know? so what, what what's going on with the hospital? I know people are spending. I, I work I work for the New York City Health Department and Health and Hospitals Corporation. And we spend a lot of time in meetings trying to make hospitals friendlier to patients. Um, I know Mount Sinai Hospital in New York has a big lobby now where you can get us food and they have music occasionally. So what's going on in hospitals? And this is not just by accident. No, and you know, a lot of the research I talk about throughout the book, it sort of slots into this field known as evidence-based design. And it applies to all sorts of buildings, but that was really born in hospitals in the 80s and 90s. Um, and you can imagine why, you know, um, the occupants of hospitals often are ill, uh, they tend to be vulnerable, and anything you can do environmentally to improve their health and well-being really matters. Um, so there's been a lot of research on hospitals, and you know, one of the takeaways is that things that might seem like luxuries, um, which you just mentioned, like a really nice view of some sort of natural feature and your own room, there's actually really good clinical reasons for them and a lot of benefits. Um, so the, the nature studies I mentioned before are, were originally done in hospitals. There's a famous one from 1984 that shows that patients who are recovering from surgery um, and happen to have a view of trees um, use fewer painkillers and are actually discharged from the hospital sooner than those whose patient rooms are essentially identical, but instead just look out onto a brick wall. Um, and so that's better for patients, but it's also, as you can imagine, better for a hospital, um, for their bottom line, to have patients who are being discharged more quickly and, and using fewer medications. Um, and single patient rooms are the same way. Um, that's one of the best ways to reduce hospital infection rates is to give patients all their own rooms. Um, but it also reduces noise, which has benefits for patients. It seems to improve uh, patient clinician communication. So there are a lot of good clinical reasons uh, to incorporate these features. Okay, and the other thing I wanna ask about is prisons. Mm -hmm. And go into um, how solitary confinement is now viewed as almost like torture. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot, so, a lot, so I had a friend who just said he feels like he's under house arrest. You can go out for like an hour a day and exercise. 
but he says that, you know, in the beginning of the lockdown, that's what a lot of people felt like, and they were really going crazy. Mm -hmm. And in prison, you, you talk about how in solitary confinement, people do actually go crazy. Mm -hmm. and so what are, what are prisons, are prisons actually spending money um, to make a healthier environment for, for their prisoners? Um, some are. That is sort of movement towards humane prison design is something that is growing. Um, it tends to be more associated with like the Scandinavian countries than us here in the U.S. where we have just an enormous um, correctional population. Uh, but that is something that's gaining um, gaining favor. And, you know, you talk about spending money and again, like similar to hospitals, that might cost money up front, but the idea and the hope is that it saves money, you know, over the lifetime of the building. One reason there's been such momentum for criminal justice reform, at least in a bipartisan way, is that our system now, in addition to being just inhumane, is also incredibly expensive, you know, to put everyone in solitary, to have these super max facilities that are just, we know, devastating for people's mental functioning that costs a lot of money. Um, and so incarcerating fewer people and putting them in environments that are more humane um, is, is a money-saving measure as well as a, a humanitarian one. Okay. So we also talked about um, building cities that promote um, better mental health. You talked about um, happy, the city in Vancouver, I forget that was called, Happy City, maybe, and, or the, and the Center for Urban Design and in London. Um, so so, so that, that's more than, so that's you know, actually city planning. Right, that gets a bit beyond the, the building scale. Right. But, you know, I do notice that um, when I went to London that they had bicycles all over and then a year later, Bloomberg went to London and he thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think these things, you know, tend to make people happier. All right, so let's say, okay, so you have a home. What, what, if you, what, if, what can people do on a practical level? Like you can't tilt your home, you know, east or west, but what can people do on a practical level, level to make their home a better environment, um, better for their, you know, children if they have them or, and also safer, because that's the other thing is you want to prevent falls and you want to do a lot of things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, so in addition to the big ones, you know, nature and daylight, um, another really important thing is ventilation. Um, and that's important. A lot of people are thinking about it right now with COVID-19 because bringing in more fresh air from the outside can sort of help dilute any pathogens that might be in the air and reduce disease transmission. But it's important for lots of other reasons as well. Um, the indoor environment, produces a lot of air pollutants. We normally think of like outdoor air as the air that's dirty, um, but our indoor air has plenty of pollutants in it as well. And so things, whether it's like turning an exhaust fan on or as simple as opening a window, increasing the airflow um, can have a lot of benefits for our physical health, but also our um, things like our cognitive performance. You know, there's recent research showing that um, sort of even moderate buildup of CO2 indoors, like the kind of buildup you might get just from our breathing can impair our cognitive functioning. And if you bring in more fresh air, it can reverse some of those effects. Um, so ventilation is a big one. Um, if it's a, a single family home with a lot of different members, you know, people aren't all the same, they have different needs. And so creating different kinds of spaces in your home, you know, maybe there's a good space for the whole family to be together, but ensuring that everyone also has some sort of private space somewhere um, where they can retreat and sort of disconnect from people is just as important as so social interaction, um, which is something a lot of people are probably contending with right now when we're all cooped up together all the time in our homes. Um, so I, I have um, some smart technology. I have an Amazon Echo. Um, and but you talked about there are good things about smart technology and you can turn your oven on and all this kind of stuff, but there's also some privacy concerns about, um, you know, you talk about smart beds, which can collect all this data on you, but are the watches we wear, all these things. And, and but, 
this data, it goes somewhere. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's privacy concerns. Um, I mean, yes, they can help you. I mean, they can tell you if your heart's beating too fast and things like that. But um, so, okay, so we have, there are smart TVs now. Do we, are there smart homes? Is that, is that gonna be the way of the future? I mean, I don't think we yet have like entire house-wide structures that just have, you know, intelligence sort of built into their bones everywhere. Um, but that definitely has been something researchers are looking at and are increasingly interested in. You know, I saw a prototype for a house that had um, sensors sort of built into the floor under the floorboards themselves that could, you know, monitor people's gates, detect when they fall, uh, presumably, or they hope help diagnose disease at the very earliest stages. A lot of diseases cause gate change, um, mm -hmm. you know, smart mirrors that can diagnose conditions based on facial movements or pupils. Um, we're seeing a lot of this stuff, a lot proof of concept for a lot of this stuff, you know, whether it's something that the public really accepts, I think is an open question. And, you know, as I mentioned, it comes with a lot of dangers. Uh, but the technology is now allowing a lot of these capabilities. Um, so what would you like to see? Um, we'd like to see communities, you know, meet, getting together and talking about, you know, the kind of homes they have or, you know, I mean, I, I know that there are cities, um, you know, there, are plan there have been planned cities in the United States, and, um, Virginia, and places like that. And do you think there's a need for that to really plan a community? When they, I mean, like Levittown was a very early example of a planned community, and um, but every house looked the same, and um, you know, and there's certainly you know homes built. You know, you know, my mother lived in a condominium that was for seniors, and they had a central place to eat, and then an entertainment facility, and things to do, and all these kinds of stuff. So is that part of, um, you know, is that, you know, you kind of have inner space, but you also have an inner space that you go to and stuff. Is that something that you think is, make, you know, this is, makes sense? Well, yeah, I mean, I think planning in and out, like, I would definitely recommend that people be thoughtful about design, both at the building level and at sort of the neighborhood and citywide level um, and sort of think about what they want to build and why but you know planning alone as you allude to isn't necessarily some silver bullet you know levittown is famously only allowed white families in and so you know you can plan all you want but it's a question of what your values are and like who are you designing for and why and what are you prioritizing and so you could have a planned community that prioritizes all the sort of wrong things and it's still not a humane space. Um, so planning is helpful, but I, I guess what I'd advocate beyond that is to really think through values. You know, what we build is a reflection of who we value and what we value. And so we have a chance to express that through our buildings and our communities. And that's really, I think what it's important to think through, like what are you trying to accomplish and, and why and, and for whom? So I, I was thinking that, you know, in the, in the, I, mean, I live in a landmark building and, I, and it, we have stairs, no elevators. And that's probably the best thing to have right now during a pandemic. Um, and you also talk about, you know, the need for people to climb stairs and, you know, intelligent design for homes and things. Um, so what, what, I mean, do, do, you, do you advocate home gyms or do you think that's something that's, you know, or should people be exercising outdoors? Well, I mean, I think for that, it's sort of a, it's so personal, like it's a question of, I think whatever exercise you're most likely to do is, is what you should pursue. So if you're like a treadmill or elliptical person, you know, absolutely, it, the more convenient and, um, sort of friction free you can make it if that's putting a, an elliptical in your home the better but if you're never going to use that um, and you're a kind of run or bike outside person or 
you know, you're on some organized sports team. Um, so it's a question of knowing sort of yourself. Um, but the, what you mentioned about stairs is interesting because there are also ways we can sort of design movement into our spaces in ways that sort of encourage people to move more. So by making staircases more appealing and more convenient, um, that can encourage people to take the stairs instead of an elevator when there is a choice or you know, creating um, aesthetically appealing, attractive walking paths can make people more likely to go for a walk. Um, so there are ways we can sort of nudge behavior with design. Um, so I just want to remind people, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. <clears throat> Don't put them in the chat box. Um, and um, so what changes have you made since you're in your home since you wrote this book? Uh, the big one, and I don't mean to sound like a broken <laughs> record here, but it's the truth is, is plants. Um, I've always yeah. liked plants, but you know, I've added dozens more. Um, I definitely think more about ventilation when I do things like cooking and cleaning. Um, you know, unfortunately we don't have a range hood, which is something that's really helpful um, when you're cooking to reduce pollution, but we do have a window that we have a fan in and you know, make sure it's set to exhaust when we cook um, to eliminate the, the pollutants. Um, those are some big ones. You know, unfortunately I'm a, a renter in, in New York City. So like, I don't have a lot of leeway to make really substantial changes to my home, but I've tried to make sort of small tweaks where I can. Okay, um, I, run, I am too. Um, so before I turn it over to questions and please put them in the Q&A box. Um, Tell me about the study with the Amish and the Hutterites, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, because I mm -hmm. thought that was very interesting. Yeah, so this is a study. Um, so people may have heard of what's sometimes called the hygiene hypothesis. That's It's a bit of a misnomer, um, sometimes now called the old friends hypothesis. But the general idea is that exposure to a rich assortment of microbes when we're young um, helps train our immune systems and protects us from a variety of diseases later in life. So the idea is, you know, if you're getting exposed to all these different bacteria, it helps teach your immune system not to overreact to things like allergens or other things that might be coming down the pike. Um, so it, it's been a hard theory to test, um, but the Amish and the Hutterites provide really interesting sort of natural experiment because in a lot of ways, these communities are similar. Um, they have a similar genetic background, Central European. Uh, they're farming communities. They tend to have large families, um, but there are also some real differences in their lifestyles. Um, so the Amish um, tend not to use modern technology. So like they use horse-drawn plows in their fields. Um, and they also live on single family farms. So the barns tend to be really close to the homes and the children t typically spend a lot of time in the barns and you know, around livestock. The Hutterites on the other hand, live on these big communal farms and they use industrial farming equipment. Um, and partly as a result of that, the you know, main um, machinery of the farm, the processing, the animals tend to be located farther away from the homes and the kids don't really spend as much time around livestock. Um, and it turns out that this has ramifications or researchers think it has ramifications for the way these kids' immune systems develop. Um, the Amish kids, who are again, the ones who spend more time around livestock, um, seem to have um, different ratios of white blood cells in a way that sort of makes them less reactive to inflammation um, and allergens. And also asthma rates are much, much lower in Amish communities, um, like 5%, where in Hutterite kids, asthma rates are above 20%, um, and they have immune systems that are, are more reactive to, to threats. Um, and the theory is that that's because they're exposed to fewer of these sort of livestock and, and farm-associated microbes. Okay, and just for me and the audience, who are the Hutterites? So I've seen witness, I know who the Amish are, but okay. It, I mean, it's there, it's a similar, it's a farming community, um, tend to be, I think this study, 
I want to say Indiana, um, but there are communities of them, um, you know, spread throughout the U.S. and they descend from sort of Central European um, ancestry and, um, you know, farming is, is the big value and they live in these communal farms. Um, and do they use technology or they don't? Yes, they, so that's one of the differences between them and the Amish is they do use this industrial, you know, modern farming equipment. And okay. so their farms are sort of more bigger and more industrial operations. So I imagine they're bigger on social media than the Amish. I don't know about that though. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so I had a question. Um, this is from one of the, that was written in. What are some of the characteristics that support a good life? Well-being, positive energy, orientation to successful outcomes and fulfilled relationships. Oof. That might be a little bit beyond my okay. remit, but um, I mean, in terms of buildings, maybe one way to answer that, it's something I've been thinking about is um, sort of the concepts of choice and control. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to set up your own home exactly the way you like it, um, but we're all different and have different needs and sensitivities. So I think one of the takeaway principles in terms of setting up an office or, um, you know, a museum or any other space that's going to be used by lots of different people is to create different kinds of environments within that building. Um, you know, maybe a quiet refuge and then a busy place for socializing and really giving building occupants the power to select their own sort of micro environments. So maybe there's a metaphor in there about choice and control in our own lives and, and variety. But I think the broader question about a good life, maybe I, I'm not the right person for. Um, okay, so um, another question I have, given the current real estate scene in New York City, what kind of apartment building would you build in a space between two buildings formerly occupied by a five-story walk-up building that had three small apartments on each floor? What design elements would you incorporate to make it a health promoting space? That's a tough question too. Yeah, um, and I, I guess I should preface it by saying that I am not an architect or designer. Uh, so, um, you know, I take this with a grain of salt, but I guess if you, I don't know if I'm envisioning this correctly, but I would imagine that one of the challenges with squeezing a building in between two existing buildings is you're going to naturally be limiting access to daylight and fresh air. So I think those are the two things I'd be most conscious of um, when designing and trying to think of innovative ways to make sure you're still allowing lots of light and air into the building. Um, I mean, one of the big problems, and you know, there were several, but with the tenement buildings that were so notorious in, in New York City history, um, you know, back in the late 19th century is that they were packed together on really small lots and it really limited sort of the fresh air and light that was coming into the buildings in a way that really fostered a lot of disease. Um, so I guess it's a, a long-winded answer, but daylight and fresh air and ventilation would be things I'd be concerned about on a site like that and would want to think about from the beginning. Okay. So uh, let's see, I've got another question here. Um, okay, no, not really. okay, that was answered. Um, so you talked about um, going to Mars in your book, mm -hmm. in your book. Um, and I, I actually wrote an article about you know, how, how people would get to Mars and the problems of not being able to communicate. But, and I know that there are there are people building um, all kinds of things in Hawaii. They're building, both in Hawaii and Russia, they built models, you know, for people to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think you talked about amphibious um, homes. Mm -hmm. um, so do you envision at some point that will be, people will be living in other habitats or planets? Yeah, I mean, I don't, if so, it's going to be on a pretty long time scale, like not in my lifetime, I don't expect it and probably not in my children's or maybe even my grandchildren's lifetime. I mean, it's 
a big, big project, these environments are really hostile. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons I was interested in exploring this area is the climate and the environment here on Earth is becoming more extreme and hostile in a lot of ways. And so in addition to, you know, how we build homes on Mars being sort of an interesting thought experiment, it also has a lot of lessons to teach us about mm -hmm. living in extreme environments, living with, you know, fewer resources, treading more lightly on the land, sustainability, off-grid mm -hmm. engineering, and all of those technologies are things that would be really useful for us right here on Earth. Um, so maybe that's a bit of a cop-out as an answer, um, but I guess I'm skeptical that living off earth is going to be in our short-term future. Um, but I do think it's still worthwhile to think about how we might survive in those extreme environments. So tell me, what is wellness real estate? So that wellness real estate is sort of been a, a big trend, a growing trend in the last few years. Um, you know, people might know of, of something called LEED, which is a certification a building can get um, you know, if it's eco-friendly, if it incorporates certain sustainability um, elements. And wellness real estate is sort of a parallel um, track in which buildings can get different certifications. And there are several of them now, um, you know, like a building can get a well building certification if it meets certain benchmarks and incorporates certain features that are known to be good for occupants. So, you know, using materials that are low VOC, that is they don't emit a lot of pollutants into the air or incorporating bike storage because that encourages people to bike to work. Um, so there are all these different features that buildings can incorporate. And if they you know, get enough points, they can get like a well building certification. Um, so that's the general idea. And there's, you know, it's sort of a, a parallel to sustainable building is sort of wellness building. And often those things go hand in hand, but they are different. Okay. So I've worked in offices where they, they talk about where I would get a headache or kind of the sick building syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I would feel, as soon as I left, I would feel better. Mm -hmm. so I know that that's a ventilation problem. I was thinking about the, today, the, the, the trend in modern offices is to not have individuals have private offices, but everyone to be working either in cubicles or just an open, like 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 we see, if you see a film about a newsroom, an open atmosphere. And you said that that's not great for everybody, like people who have maybe age, age ADHD, um, people who need to concentrate or like their privacy. And you also said it spreads disease, you know, I'm thinking the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, open setting is gonna spread, you know, someone sneezes, in a private office is a lot different than someone sneezes in a cubicle that's near next to you or in like an open area. So what do you think? So, so, that, so we, we, you know, we do spend 90% of our indoors, but it's not, a, not all of it's at home. Some of it's in the office. And how do you think offices should be um, designed for, you know, ideal for our health as well as um, efficiency in working? Yeah, I mean, basically the only people that open offices are good for our employers, and that's because they're relatively cheap and they're flexible. Um, I mean, some people are sort of more sensitive to the distractions that come with open offices than others, but in general, employees almost universally hate them, and there's study after study that shows that they're bad for performance, they're bad for morale, they're bad for communication, they're bad for physical health, as you mentioned. So, um, you know, ideally, if, you know, I could just be the office design dictator, I would love to see private offices make a comeback. Um, I think realistically, that's not likely in part because they are so much more expensive. Um, and so I think the, you know, what may be possible is to sort of create environments that do more of this sort of enable more of this choice and control that I mentioned earlier. So, different micro environments, um, you know, desks and cubicles, but also some more private spaces that employees can go to if they need to concentrate or if they need privacy um, and sort of allowing, you know, trusting workers to know their own needs. So giving them 
a lot of spaces they can choose from and then allowing them to actually follow through and, and choose their own workspaces. So I know before the pandemic, um, WeWork was very popular, mm -hmm. um, places like that. I have friends who work at, out of Starbucks and I don't know how they do it, but they do it, um, free Wi-Fi. But um, so, so do you think the pandemic is gonna change the way we work since working remotely seems to be people for companies? Um, and what do you think are some of the trade-offs of working remotely and working in an office? Yeah, well, so, you know, I've seen some hopeful headlines and pieces saying things like, could this be the end of the open office? And I guess I'm pessimistic about that just for the reason I mentioned before, which is that they're so appealing to companies and to employers. It's hard to imagine going back to an era of private offices. But I do think we will see some remote work stick around. Um, and again, not necessarily that everyone's gonna be remote all the time, but I think you'll see companies maybe downsize to smaller office footprints and they'll have employees, you know, working at home a few days a week, but then bringing them together in the office maybe once or twice a week or, you know, semi-regularly. Um, and that allows companies to, you know, save money on real estate and shifts a bunch of the costs, unfortunately, to workers. Um, but in terms of trade-offs, you know, the main one I think is that research suggests that despite all of our fancy technology, despite Slack and, you know, all the devices we have, that face-to-face -face communication is really still the gold standard when it comes to collaboration and workplace productivity and performance. Um, and so obviously remote working removes that, you know, that, I, and I don't think Zoom really counts as face-to-face as -face communication. Um, so even though working at home and, you know, during normal times that not during a pandemic might allow you to sort of concentrate and focus more, I do think some of the trade-off you see in like collaboration and teamwork um, and, and, and that sort of that sort of workplace activity. And so that's another reason why I think maybe employers might try to balance some remote work with some in-office work. Okay, um, here's a question. Um, about seven years ago, an observational study indicated that children of families with dishwashers had more allergies than children of families who hand washed and towel dried their dishes. Have there been more studies similar to that which show results one way or the other? You know, I actually, I don't know about that study. That's sort of fascinating. So there, the studies that tend to be cited in that area um, have to do with animals. So like there's a lot of research that children that grow up around livestock or even dogs um, have fewer allergies. I had not seen the dishwasher one. Um, and so I don't know of other studies like that. I do know of some studies that have sort of looked at dishwashers as ecosystems and found um, some unique forms of, of life there, like some kinds of black yeasts and molds that don't seem to grow anywhere else that may have sort of evolved specifically for the extreme environment of dishwashers. Um, so what theoretically maybe could be happening is, you said more allergies in homes with dishwashers, right? That was yes. the question said. So, I mean, I, it's plausible, I guess, that the molds that grow in dishwashers, you know, produce allergens and that could be triggering allergies perhaps. Um, but I don't know exactly what's going on there. That's, that's something I'll have to look into. Um, so what about um, the idea of, you know, so for children, what, 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 can, what can you do to improve their experience at home? Well, in a, lot, in a lot of ways, kids aren't, you know, that different from the rest of us. And so the same things that make your home healthier that we've been talking about are, are good for children, too. Um, I think children may be especially sensitive to their environments, you know, their critical periods of development. Um, that are, are really important for them gaining certain, you know, cognitive skills and social skills. And so I'd imagine that if you have a bad environment, um, 
children would be particularly sensitive to it. Um, I mean, there are some interesting studies that show things like um, growing up in a noisy home can interfere with kids' language learning ability and, and reading abilities. So things like if you have a constant din of traffic outside, that can make it harder for children to discriminate between sounds in a way that makes it harder to learn language. Um, so they're interesting studies, sort of developmental studies like that. But um, the big principles, you know, noise is bad and light is good, like those, those also apply to kids. Okay, so my co-chair Joe Bonner said, I want to know, can, can you comment on the air filtration systems and buildings, and how indoor, door, indoor air can be made cleaner and safer during the pandemic, but also for other viruses and toxins? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's one thing that a lot of people are gonna be doing as we sort of reopen, um, if we reopen at some point in places. Um, so generally hospitals have pretty good ventilation and air filtration um, and deliberately so because they're dealing with so many vulnerable patients and people who might be harboring pathogens. So they have these really high quality like particle filters and really high ventilation rates. Um, but that's not true of a lot of other commercial buildings. Like your average office building doesn't necessarily have a super high tech, powerful air filter. Um, I think that's about to change. I think we will see more stores and offices and non-medical spaces sort of getting these very high quality filters. Um, the other thing to think about, I guess, is recirculation versus new air from outside. Um, so for sustainability reasons, a lot of HVAC systems are set up to sort of filter and then recirculate indoor air, which is less energy intensive than sort of pushing the indoor air out and drawing in new air from outdoors. Um, but from a health perspective, it's better to bring in more fresh air from outdoors. Um, so there is a balance there, but if you're talking about purely minimizing disease transmission, minimizing exposure to air pollutants, that the best thing to do is to increase airflow from outdoors, whether that's opening a window, that's one way to do it. Um, but also a lot of you know, ventilation systems, you can adjust the amount which they recirculate versus bring in fresh air. And you know, when, when feasible, bringing in fresh air is, is gonna be better for your health. Okay, so um, so just uh, ask you like a personal question. So are you, you know, you, know, you just published a book. Um, you really can't do a book tour. <laughs> no. What you would like to do a book tour. Um, how comfortable are you flying right now? Um, you know, I wouldn't do it just for fun, like if I needed to get, you know, if there were some sort of family emergency, I needed to get somewhere, I would do it. Um, the interesting thing about flying is that it's from what we know, it seems like the plane itself is not the biggest risk. Um, again, planes are environments where there's a long history of thinking carefully about airflow and filtration and air quality. Um, the risk is more likely to come from the airport or, you know, your taxi to the airport or your bus to the airport than it is from the plane itself. Um, but personally, I, I would fly if I had to, but not just, you know, to go on vacation. Okay. Um, and exactly. Um, so I'd like to, you know, you know, since we are, you know, science and health and medicine, um, how do we design, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, not, not only kids, but for the elderly. You, you talk, I mean, years ago, with Alzheimer's patients, they found that certain colors help them a little bit. Um, um, so, so how do we make our, you know, our home, our home for people who live alone or, or getting elderly how do we make our homes safer for them and what should we be what should we you know a ch child be thinking about for their parent yeah that's you know there's been it's maybe not surprising but there's been a lot of research on creating sort of communal living or senior homes assisted living facilities that are safer for the elderly and there's been much less on private homes. Um, 
I mean, some of it is, you know, sort of common sense things like no slip floor coverings that, you know, might reduce falls, um, you know, widening doorways, um, keeping all the important functions of the home on one floor, um, building that sort of flexibility into a home from the beginning, if possible. Um, there's a lot of interest in what I talk about in some detail in the book is sort of incorporating technology in certain ways. Um, so things like fall detection systems, uh, I mentioned the sensors and the floorboards, you know, the big application for that and probably the closest to actually really being commercialized is for detecting falls among seniors who live alone. You know, we know that um, seniors who spend fall and then spend a lot of time on the floor alone before being discovered have much worse outcomes than those who are found relatively quickly. So things like that, there's a lot of interest in. Um, at sort of the larger group living level, there's been some interesting work on wayfinding and like how to create layouts so people who might be in early stages of dementia don't get lost and can find their room more easily. Um, that's maybe a bit less relevant in a private home, um, but that's where a lot of the research attention has been. Um, so I was also interested in, um, you know, so you know, we, we talked a lot about um, with the pandemic opening up restaurants and first they opened them out, out to outside dining. And then we were gonna have in New York City anyways, indoor dining that's been put on hold. And we now found that indoor dining is, is just riskier. I mean, places that have it, they're seeing rates going up. So is that, you think that's a problem of ventilation? That's a problem of just design? I mean, how, how can we make a healthier restaurant? Yeah, I mean, it's, I would almost be more inclined to fly right now than I would be to eat indoors in a restaurant. Like I absolutely would not do that right now. Um, and it's like a combination of, you know, like so ventilation is, can be a problem. And if it's a poorly ventilated space, increasing the ventilation will help. But part of it's just like, if you think about the nature of what a restaurant is, I mean, all the research so far suggests that the biggest risks come when we spend extended periods of time in enclosed spaces with lots of other people. And that might as well be, you know, a definition of a restaurant. People are sitting there sometimes for hours, um, they're talking. So there's also some suggestion that, you know, people are talking a lot or yelling. A lot of restaurants are loud. So if people are raising their voices. That might prompt anyone who's sort of infected to uh, disperse more viral particles into the air. It's just, it's really hard because I think the nature of what a restaurant is, is gonna make that an inherently risky environment. Um, I would eat outdoors, you know, like we were seeing all the, the tables on the sidewalk and I think that reduces the risk quite a bit, but indoors in a restaurant, I think it's gonna be a while. Have you eaten, uh, have you eaten outdoors yet? Um, I have not eaten outdoors. We have done some of these. So like last night we got takeout and took it to the park and ate it, you know, mm -hmm. in Prospect Park. Um, I have not eaten at an outdoor part of a restaurant yet, but I would. Do you have any suggestions for the balance, <clears throat> for the balance between keeping a clean house <clears throat> without going overboard in the face of the, the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting and important question. Um, and I guess I have, in terms of like very practical tips, I have two. Um, one would be to stay away from bleach. Um, and you know, when you can, that is, that is more for air quality reasons, but like we know that bleach can volatilize um, into fumes that can irritate the lungs. It can react with all sorts of other household compounds that produce very toxic, very dangerous gases and compounds. And when it comes to the coronavirus, we just don't need it. Like it's a useful tool in some scenarios, but the coronavirus is really responsive to soap and water. So like absolutely keep your home clean. That's important right now, but soap and water is gonna be really effective without releasing fumes. Um, the other um, recommendation I guess would be to stay away from products that are marketed specifically as being antibacterial. Um, 
or that have added antibacterials to them, I should say, things like triclosan that are in a lot of household materials. I mean, for one thing, the coronavirus is a virus, so you don't need an antibacterial for it, but there's evidence to suggest that those sorts of household products may be playing a role in fostering the emergence of superbugs and antibiotic resistant bacteria. So it, you just, you don't need it. Um, soap and water is, is really your best bet there. What products should you be avoiding that have triclosan? Well, a lot of products have triclosan and now. Um, I don't know that, it, but like cutting boards are impregnated with them. There are wipes, there are hand soaps. Um, there basically any household product you can think of. There's a version of it that has anti has added antimicrobials. Um, a lot of an increasing number of like building materials or you're seeing like upholstery fabrics that have it impregnated. I mean, it's really, um, it, it's become a, a whole a whole thing. It's not necessarily great for us or the world. Okay. Um, okay, I have a question. How can one get rid of VOCs uh, when buying new furniture? And I'm not sure what VOCs are. Uh, so those are volatile organic compounds and mm -hmm. They, um, so sort of in the name volatile, they volatilize. So um, a, a lot of consumer products contain them and sort of they're off gassed or released into the air. Um, and that's a hard question because basically all products contain them. And also because there are so many of them like that there's a lot that remains unknown. Um, I don't know that I have like really good advice for that, though we do know that things like, you probably wanna stay away from furniture products that have sort of these added features. So like, as I mentioned, added antimicrobials is one, but you also like flame retardants are a big source of VOCs and air pollutants. And, you know, it's very easy to find like sofas and rugs that have been doused in flame retardants. So. If you can stay away from some of those sort of added chemicals, that'll help or, or should help reduce your exposure. But you should basically live like a Unabomber and just uh, not clean and totally off the grid. No, I mean, it is a balance. And especially right now, you know, like okay. some of the risk balance mm -hmm. ratio is different. You know, maybe you want to err more on the side of cleaning more, which is like understandable, but there is going too far. Okay. So I think we're gonna end here. That was the last question. Um, so I just wanna <clears throat> show your book again. It's called The Great Indoors. Um, <clears throat> usually when I do book interviews, we sell the books. So I would please ask you to buy the book. It's very readable. Um, how can they, where can they buy the book? I bought it on, I, I got it on Amazon. Yeah, um, but Amazon, Barnes and Noble, a lot of independent bookstores are selling it. Um, basically anywhere you can buy books, you can buy this, or you can ask them to order it for you if they don't carry it, so. Okay, and <clears throat> give some final words about uh, The Great Indoors. Well, I guess one thing people sometimes, these interviews sometimes get uh, dark and depressing, but I think one thing oh, that- this wasn't. No, but one thing that I do see happening now um, because of the pandemic is a lot of people are paying more attention to the quality of their indoor environments. And so I think we have an opportunity and we now have enough knowledge. Like there is now a lot of scientific evidence about how to create healthy environments that like that is something that we have the capability to do if we want to. We can create environments that, you know, not only make us less likely to get COVID-19, but reduce our exposure to air pollutants and make us happier and more fit. And so that, those are things that are within our grasp now. So it's, it's an exciting time to be thinking about the indoor environment. Okay, so let's end there. And <clears throat> thank you for spending some time with us and uh, st stay safe and everyone else listening, please stay safe. Thank you all for tuning in. I, I appreciate your, your time on, on this. So Wednesday, Wednesday evening. You can't see Hamilton tonight, so. No. Unless <laughs> on the Disney Channel. Okay, well, thank you so much and great seeing you. And uh, this, and for people who didn't see this or your friends, this will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow.
Okay, take care and uh